Okay, well, welcome back. And uh, I think that starting out today, we should probably decide on a review session. Okay, so um, how many people, we have to do it this week because unfortunately next week the room's not available. And um, so how many people would like to do it on Wednesday at this time? Oh, okay. So um, we need to uh, hold a review session, or I'd like to. Um, it's not obligatory, but it would be nice to hold a review session. And if we did it on, uh, we have to do it either Wednesday or Friday this week. So how many for Wednesday again? Okay, how about Friday? Looks like it's Wednesday then, so we'll meet here on Wednesday. And I'll continue to hold office hours up to the day of the final. But next week, um, I'll probably be in, I'll arrive at the office, and if nobody shows up within about, by about 20 after, I'm probably going to leave because uh, I don't know how many people will even be on campus next week. But, so be sure if you come to office hour next week that you show up within the first 10 minutes, like between 10 after and 20 after. And the same goes for the day of the final. All right, so last time, um, gave you a bit of an introduction to the uh, whole topic of um, signaling in plants, how plants can actually perceive stimuli. We talked about the stimulus of light and photoperiodism in particular, that is physiological responses of plants to the relative length of light and darkness, which is important with regard to flowering in particular, is one of the, the things we mainly focused on. And I just want to finish up on that by um, pointing out that it's actually not the, the length of the day that's important, but it's the uninterrupted length of the night that plants are actually perceiving. And uh, this was established after the names short day plant and long day plant were already ingrained in the literature. So those names persist for plants that flower um, during short days and plants that flower during long days. And as I mentioned, there's some plants that are day, day neutral. They just flower whenever they're at the physiological state to flower. But the experiments that were done to demonstrate that this is a, a, a night length response rather than a day length response were pretty elegant. Just uh, basically growing plants in a greenhouse situation under controlled light. And um, with a short day plant, which would normally flower after the night or after um, the day length went below a certain level in the fall or the late summer, a brief flash of light was introduced about midway through the dark period, and those plants then would, would flower. So, um, and the same sort of thing was observed with the long day plants, which typically would flower when day length reaches a certain um, period of time that flower in the late spring or early summer. And it turned out that a brief flash of intense light, just the briefest flash in both cases, would initiate flowering, um, even though the dark period was too long still for flowering to occur in this case. So it appears that, um, based on other work, that phytochrome actually is involved here, at least in part, is one of the photoreceptors sensing the overall length of the night period. And with the flash of light, phytochrome signals the end of that night period. So with the long day plant, which is basically a short night plant, that flash of light breaks up that long dark period into two short periods, and the plant senses it as a short night, and flowering is initiated. And here, where the flash of light is also introduced in the middle of that dark period, um, I, sorry, I, I actually misstated this, that the, the short day plant will not flower because the long night is not um, perceived. Instead, it's perceived as a short night. So these plants flower when the night length crosses a critical threshold, but the flash of light um, causes the plant not to perceive that as a long night. Whereas here, the flash of light suggests this is a short night, which is what it's required for a long day plant to flower. Any questions about that then? So this is, um, this is all I really have to say about, well, there's one more thing to say about photoperiodism. It's pretty interesting, and this segues into the next topic about growth regulation. 
and that is that um, experiments were also done where a plant that was, in, where flowering had been initiated, in this case a short day plant, um, had a long day plant uh, shoot grafted onto it, so physically grafted onto the tissues of this short day plant. This is a long day plant that hadn't flowered at the time. And this plant then flowered even though the day length wasn't, um, wasn't, wasn't appropriate for a long day plant to flower under those conditions. So this kind of experiment could be done the other way around too with grafting a short day shoot onto a long day plant that had already initiated and it would flower um, at a time when it normally wouldn't. So clearly something is being transmitted through the tissues of this uh, plant that's undergone uh, flowering to the tissues of, another, of this, this other plant that's resulting in initiation of flowering. And this is, uh, this sort of experiment dates long ago, I mean, for nearly uh, three, qu three quarters of a century, people have um, postulated on the basis of such data that there is a flowering hormone that's transmitted within plants. And they've even given it the name Florigen, but no one has ever successfully isolated this hormone, so it's still a complete hypothetical if it really exists but it's still called by this name in the literature and people discuss it as if it exists. It's one of the most, it's one of the stranger aspects of plant physiology. And it's possible based on some recent experiments in Arabidopsis, which is a model system for studying um, plant uh, biology, that the stimulus might not be a hormone, but might be a macromolecule, a, DNA, a protein or a nucleic acid rather than a micromolecule, which uh, hormones typically are. So that gets to the point of plant chemistry. And um, I want to talk about plant chemistry only in relation to how plants respond to environmental stimuli. And this is um, a really fascinating area about which uh, we're learning more all the time. Huge amounts been learned since I actually took botany and taught it as a graduate student. But uh, plants like animals have a lot of different ways for uh, coping with, the envir with environmental change. And of course, most animals can move in response to either a favorable stimulus or an unfavorable stimulus. They can either approach it or retreat from it. Whereas plants through most of their life cycle are immobile and are locked in place essentially. So their, their responses um, really are typically in the area of growth uh, or metabolic changes. And plant hormones are one of the ways that the plant can signal um, these, uh, this, this necessity to change, to, to under, undergo some kind of um, response. And these are often called plant growth regulators because they differ from animal hormones in some ways. They sometimes act close to the source of production. Um, but they're typically translocated within the plant or are, are moved within the plant like an animal hormone. And like animal hormones, they're organic compounds that modify or control one or more physiological responses. And those physiological responses often have to do with promoting or inhibiting growth. So these are responses like cell division, cell elongation, or cellular differentiation or maturation, the three major aspects of growth. And um, I just mentioned this, they're often transported from the site of stimulus reception to the site of response. And one of the interesting things about hormones in general is that they, they can be, um, they can have a very strong effect at, with very low concentrations. And the amount of the hormone present can have a huge effect on its, on its um, action on, on the signal that it provides to the plant. And also th that action can be affected by the type of tissue in which the hormone is in contact or, or the age of that tissue, its state of maturation. Um, and these are involved in just about every aspect of plant growth and development. Um, and one of the interesting things about plant hormones that makes them so difficult to study but also fascinating is that they're um, 
an individual hormone can be involved in many different responses in plants. As I just mentioned, the site of action, the age of the tissue, the um, amount of hormone present can have a big effect on the response. And also, uh, an individual response can involve multiple hormones, different hormones, and it's the relative concentration of these different hormones that's most important, generally. What we can think of as hormonal balance, which is something we also think about in animals. So the hormonal balance, we'll talk about that a couple of times here uh, today, is really important. So just like so many things in biology, um, some of the earliest insightful work on, these, on, on plant hormones was done by Charles Darwin in association with his son Francis back near the end of his life in the 1880s. And what they did is they grew, they grew up grass seedlings. And remember, grasses um, germinate directly through the soil. The tip of the um, shoot emerges sheathed in a, what's called a coleoptile, the sheath that uh, emerges directly from the, from the soil. And it was the bending of these coleoptiles in response to light that, that the Darwins studied. And so they found that, um, that these coleoptiles would bend toward the light, which is a pretty adaptive response, it would seem, to, um, in terms of maximizing photosynthesis. And so they wanted to understand how that occurred and what that involved. So they did various things, but one of the things they did that was interesting is they cut off the tip of that coleoptile and they saw that no bending, this growth response that resulted in bending didn't occur. And so maybe that was just a, some sort of wound uh, problem with wounding the plant. So they covered up the tip with a, a light impenetrable cover and they also saw no bending. So the next thing they tried is they covered up the area where the bending actually occurs and the thing still bent. Um, so they concluded that light is um, sensed by the top of the chute and that, that uh, some sort of hormonal signal is sent down the, through the plant to a, po a point of response where there's a growth response that uh, results in bending toward light. So this was the first evidence for plant hormones. And um, this elicited a lot of interest by others, and there were other experiments done with the same system after Darwin. And one of them was this one, which established that this phototropic signal is actually a chemical, uh, as Darwin suspected. And what was done here was that the uh, sliced off tip of the coleoptile was placed on a little block of auger. We talked about auger, of course, as uh, this carbohydrate extracted from red algae, and it's permeable. Um, this was placed uh, in between the rest of the coleoptile and its tip. And what was seen is this growth response still occurred, whereas if you put a place, uh, whereas if an impenetrable object was placed between the tip and the rest of the uh, coleoptile, in this case, a little sheet of mica, there was no bending. So the conclusion from this experiment was that indeed some chemical was transmitted down through the, sh through the coleoptile as Darwin suspected. Okay, and then it wasn't until the 1920s that uh, Fritz Wendt at Caltech performed a uh, kind of decisive experiment here where um, basically using the same system, this tip of the coleoptile uh, that had been initiated uh, or had been exposed to light and um, had undergone uh, some exposure to light was cut off and placed again on a little block of auger with a sufficient time for any um, diffusion to occur into this auger, which is shown here by the red um, the active substance here. And then this was placed on different uh, coleoptiles that had also had their tops, their tips excised that hadn't been exposed to light. And it was placed offset to one side, either one side or the other, on different coleoptiles. And a growth response was seen with bending away from the, the edge that the auger was placed on. 
And when the tissues of those coleoptiles was looked at in more detail down near the area of bending, it was, Wendt saw that the uh, cells had elongated along the side that the auger was placed on. So the idea here was that then not only was a chemical transmitted down here, the chemical was resulting in an elongation of cells along the side um, or, or in response to this chemical. And so apparently on the dark side of the coleoptile, away from light, there was, um, there was a growth response by this transmitted chemical, which he called auxin, which just means to increase. It wasn't known what it was at the time. It was later dis discovered to be endolacetic acid, and there's some other uh, related um, substances called auxins as, as well that uh, have a number of different responses. And so this was the first plant hormone that was really studied, and it turns out to be a really important plant hormone. And like other plant hormones, it's involved in a number of different effects. And one of the ones we've already talked about is apical dominance. That is how a shoot will have a, a primary apical meristem that's active, whereas axillary meristems will be suppressed, will be inhibited, or won't be active. And it turns out, um, as we already mentioned, if you cut off the tip, the, the active tip of a shoot, these axillary buds that are found in the upper axles of leaves here will suddenly be initiated. And here you can see a little some evidence of this. This tip was just cut off and here go the axillary buds becoming new shoots that are growing upward like the original tip. And um, one typically becomes dominant. So that's uh, pretty strong and, and uh, and um, clear response to, to the removal of the apical meristem. And it turns out that studies of the presence of auxin within shoots shows that the active apical meristem is where auxin is produced at high con or relatively high concentrations. And with its removal then, we have um, removal of what's assumed to be an, an, what's, what appears to be an inhibitor of these of these side shoots, of these axillary buds. And we'll get more to that in a minute. So as I mentioned also, um, these plant hormones have different effects on different tissues. And another uh, completely different effect occurs with auxin in the presence of ovary tissue. And so one of the things that's been seen is that auxin is produced in proximity to or perhaps by the seeds of a developing um, ovary, a uh, developing fruit. And uh, here we can see a normal tomato where there was normal pollination and fertilization with the auxin produced in the vicinity of the seeds being important for normal fruit development. And in the absence of fertilization of those seeds, if there's no pollination, the tomato fruit won't develop. But if you apply auxin, if you spray auxin on that ovary, even if there's no pollination, the ovary can develop. And this is done to ensure fruit development in tomatoes and some other fruits in the absence of any um, pollinators. So auxin does have this um, ability, this, this signaling for fruit development. So again, auxin is involved in cell elongation not division, but elongation. In coleoptiles on the dark side of the shoot, on stems on the light side, it turns out, so those experiments by Darwin and others were a little bit misleading. Oxen op operates in slightly different ways in stems, but also in regard to elongation of cells. It also operates in apical dominance, fruit development, and in lateral root formation, formation of branching from the roots, as we'll talk about in a moment. All right, so um, another point that I made earlier just briefly was that different concentrations of hormones can have really different effects on the tissues that they're uh, in contact with. And this is the case with auxin. As you can see, here's a gradient of auxin from low to high concentration, um, higher in this direction. And here we can see a positive effect of growth effect and an inhibitory effect of auxin with no effect here. 
So what you see here is the different parts of the plant are sensitive to different concentrations. Um, but in each case, there's a, a, a response that's quite similar as auxin is increased, but at different levels. So we initially get an increase in growth, but then an inhibition of growth. And if we look at this in stems, you can see the concentration of auxin that's maximally stimulative of, of stem growth is strongly inhibiting of bud growth of those axillary buds as uh, that experiment of cutting off the tip showed. And of course, the stem tip is producing a lot of auxin. So you cut off that tip, the amount of auxin re is reduced in the stem, and we end up with maximal initiation of buds and suppression of roots at that level. Stems aren't even affected at the level that initiates bud growth in terms of the main stem. So, the question? Yeah, Brad? That's right, yeah, it's just a generic term. It's not uh, specific as to chemistry, particularly, that's right. Um, cytokinins are, uh, were, much, were discovered much later in the 1940s, but they're also really important, and it turns out that the balance of cytokinin to auxin is, is really important for, plant, uh, for, for the plant growth response. And um, so cytokinins are named because they promote cell division, and cytokinin comes from cytokinesis, or cell division. Okay, so that's an easy way to remember the term. Uh, and remember that auxins promote elongation of cells, not division of cells. So cytokinins operating with auxins are important for the overall growth response since both division and elongation are important in growth. And so a high cytokinin to auxin ratio uh, promotes activation of, of shoot branching, this axillary bud branching that we talked about. And the, a low cytokinin to auxin ratio promotes activation of lateral roots, so branching of the roots. And um, I mentioned that auxin can uh, stimulate lateral root production, and it's really the, the low cytokinin to auxin ratio that promotes that, relatively high auxin compared to cytokinin here. So I already mentioned this, that cytokinin promotes development of branches for act, uh, Actually, I didn't mention that. I mentioned that the reduction in the amount of auxin uh, results in the branching of the um, side shoots. But what it really is is that the cytokinin ratio, uh, there's a high cytokinin to auxin ratio when uh, after the tip is removed. And that's, um, that's what's important with regard to the overall branching of the shoot. And um, interestingly, the the cytokinins and auxins are produced in different parts of the plant body, and they're, they, they, they're mobilized. They move in, a, in opposite directions in the plant. So the auxin is moving, as I mentioned, from the shoot tips downward, and it still moves toward the roots, even if you turn the plant upside down. This is not a gravity response. Um, and cytokinins are typically produced in the roots and transported upward toward the shoot. And so this creates a gradient of cytokinin and auxin within the plant body that's important in maintaining this hormonal balance across the plant. Okay, so that's, that's one of the interesting things that was discovered about, about this interplay between cytokinins and auxins is their direction of movement is different, their place of production is different, and that helps to set up this gradient that's really important in growth. All right, so cytokinins then important in cell division and differentiation in concert with, it, with auxins involved in cell elongation for the overall growth response. And also um, axillary bud growth, um, uh, particularly when apical dominance is removed by damage to the shoot tip. But also, for example, at lower points on the stem where you'd have a higher cytokinin to auxin ratio uh, as, you, as you get further and further away from the shoot tip, there's less inhibition of buds typically. 
All right, another class of, third class of plant hormones are called gibberellins. And these are called gibberellins because um, they were originally discovered in a plant that was infected by a fungus called gibberella. It's just an aside, but that's where the name comes from. Um, and this fungus produced a, a compound that we call gibberellin that resulted in rice seedlings being strongly, being very spindly, uh, having an uncontrolled growth response. And so, so gibberellins um, have a strong effect in stem elongation and overall have a strong growth stimulating effect. So these are substances that tend to have a strong growth stimulating effect. They're also important in promoting seed germination. So the breaking of dormancy in seeds in uh, especially plants that have a light requirement for germination. And we use gibberellins all the time at really low concentrations to um, germinate seeds of certain plant species in my lab. And you can go from a plant that you can barely get to germinate, you have to dissect the embryos out to get them to germinate, to having them almost jump out of the seeds. I mean, just within less than 12 hours, they'll be fully germinated. So these have a pretty strong effect when, um, in plants that recognize them for, uh, as a stimulus for germination. And they're also used commercially to promote fruit enlargement and bunch length in seedless grapes. Um, we already talked about how oxen can stimulate the initiation of growth, uh, uh, fruit development, and gibberellins can, can actually result in larger fruits. Here's a, a bunch of grapes that weren't treated with a gibberellin spray, and here are some that were treated with a gibberellin spray. So gibberellins, um, have a lot of, of uses, and um, they also can be produced by plants in in as, re as a wound response and can promote healing in response to wounding. They have a number of responses. We're just sort of scratching the surface here in terms of some of the more outstanding um, functions. And you've probably seen bolting occur before in herbs that uh, uh, herbs that just have basal leaves until they start to produce a flowering shoot. And the production of a flowering shoot can happen really quickly, so quickly that it's called bolting. And this is something that's stimulated by gibberellic acid as well. And um, when I actually was a GSI in a class like this many years ago, we didn't even know about these compounds, these brucinosteroids. Uh, these have just been recently discovered to be plant hormones, and they're actually steroids similar to, to uh, animal sex hormones in terms of their overall um, chemistry. But they're so similar in function to oxen in terms of promoting elongation of stems that they weren't recognized as distinct from oxen. And um, uh, it's plants like these that allowed them to be recognized. These, are, uh, these plants are ones, these little dwarf ones here are ones that have... Um, minimal internodal elongation and happen to be mutants that uh, don't produce brucinosteroids. And this name brucinosteroids comes from the fact that these were discovered in Arabidopsis, which is the model system for plant biology, and it's in the Brassicaceae family or the mustard family, just an aside, but that's what the name comes from. So just to let you know that these are still being discovered, uh, this was um, a fairly recent discovery, similar to oxen. And this is a really important uh, plant hormone, abscisic acid. We just call it ABA. Um, this actually works antagonistically to gibberellins. And the um, relative balance of gibberellins and ABA can be important in, in the growth response. So I mentioned gibberellins have a really strongly stimulative effect to growth and seed germination. Whereas or abscisic acid is just the opposite. It's it has an inhibiting effect on stem growth and it's important in inducing seed dormancy and preparing the seed for desiccation as the seed matures. So uh, dormancy in seeds is usually often responsible, or abscisic acid is often responsible for that and it requires long periods of cold or 
some other stimulus to break down ABA and release the plant from that uh, dormancy um, condition. Interestingly, there are some plants that don't produce much ABA in their seeds and don't have dormancy. Uh, mangroves are really notable in this sense. They germinate while they're still on the parent plant. Here you can see the radicals, the embryonic roots emerging from seeds still in the fruits of a mangrove that haven't um, been dropped yet from the parent plant. And this kind of precocious germination is important for the survival of mangroves. And it just so happens that those seeds are really lacking in abscisic acid. Um, another thing that ABA does that has a growth inhibiting effect, but it's super important for the survival of the plant, is that ABA will signal the closure of the guard cells and the closure of the stomates, uh, stomata in, in response to wilting or any kind of drought stress that might be perceived in the roots. ABA be transmitted, for example, to the roots, to the shoot before it starts to wilt. And this sets in motion the um, release of, of potassium ions from the guard cells. So the solute concentration is reduced in the guard cells and water moves out uh, of the guard cells through, uh, based on the osmotic response. So that's, um, that's crucial for plants to, um, to, to uh, keep their, their water balance intact. And ABA is, 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 the, is the important uh, chemical signal in this regard. So again, abscisic acid is important for dormancy closing of stomata, and in general, it's a growth inhibitor. And it's this balance of ABA and gibberellins that's really important in many cases. All right, so um, ethylene is a substance that was only recognized to be a plant growth regulator relatively late. And um, that's because it functions in the gas phase which is a bizarre thing for a hormone to do. But um, this is a very important molecule for signaling the onset of, for example, leaf senescence and abscission in deciduous plants, like uh, deciduous hardwood trees. And uh, deciduous plants have what's called an abscission layer. It's a little layer of parenchyma at the base of the leaf. There are no fibers, sclerified cells, that cross through that zone. So these are just living cells uh, that have relatively thin cell walls. And ethylene, when it's produced, what happens first is that it actually results in a programmed death of cells inside the leaf. So the leaf will undergo this process where the nutrients that are in, enclosed or contained within that leaf are mobilized uh, by the breakdown of substances in the leaf, and then those are moved back into the main body of the plant. And then the abscission layer, um, uh, changes start to occur there where ethylene will stimulate the production of enzymes that break down the cell walls of those parenchyma cells in that abscission layer, such that eventually the leaf will just fall off based on its own weight or based on wind. And then cork will form over that wound. So I mean, that prevents um, infection of the plant. So ethylene has a really important effect in, in programmed cell death that can be important in capturing back the nutrients that a plant needs from tissues that are going to be discarded. And it also has a really important effect in fruit ripening. So ethylene is crucial in fruit ripening response. So it's um, involved in both the enzymatic breakdown of the cell walls. I mean, it signals the enzymatic the production of enzymes that break down the cell walls of, in the fruit, which makes the fruit soft and edible in that sense. And it also um, signals the uh, enzyme enzymes, or it, uh, it uh, re results in the production of enzymes that convert starch to sugar. So. Um, makes the fruit sweet as well. So the fruit becomes attractive to, um, to animals and uh, that disperse the seeds as a result. And this is one of the few cases in biology of a positive feedback mechanism where 
The production of ethylene le leads to ripening. Ripening then triggers more ethylene production. So this ethylene production is increased. And as a gas, ethylene produced by one fruit can trigger the ripening of other fruit in close proximity, especially if they're in closed containers like a uh, paper bag, for example. So you've no doubt had that experience where one fruit can uh, cause the one ripe fruit can, can be important with regard to the um, ripening of others. And so ethylene, um, since it was discovered as being important in this regard, it's used commercially to allow for the picking of fruit when it's still unripe and transporting it while it's unripe so it's not damaged during transport and that it lasts. And then ethylene gas is applied um, after transportation or after the fruit's ready to be marketed and the fruit will start ripening at that point. And you can store fruit for long periods of time for many months in an unripe state as long as you can control the ethylene production by the fruit. And so um, there are various filtration systems that commercial, uh, that are commercially available to remove ethylene. Um, carbon dioxide is also applied to remove ethylene. So that's, um, this is an important uh, commercial substance as well. Okay, so ethylene then is really important in both leaf abscission and fruit ripening, among other, other things. So that's really all I want to say about plant hormones per se. Um, we can just summarize them here. Of course, they can have a variety of effects depending on the site of action, concentration of the hormone, um, for example. And um, this is basically what I'm saying here. Different plant parts have different sensitivities, different concentrations. Um, so this whole notion of differential sensitivity is really important. And finally, the, they often act together. And this I've already mentioned this with regard to oxen and cyto, uh, cytokinins working together. Um, this hormone balance in regard to those two, and then the b balance in regard to gibberellins and ABA. So um, this makes them really difficult to study, of course. It's, um, it's a more, in many ways, more difficult than studying animal hormone action. And there's a lot of activity uh, still going on in terms of trying to understand how plant hormones operate. Um, but it's pretty clear that hormonal balance is, is super important in plants. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I just want to mention that plant chemistry can also be really important in terms of plant defense. And of course, plants are in a, a real bind when it comes to defending themselves when they can't get up and move. They can't ward off an enemy or a, an attacker by um, getting away from it. So they have evolved a number of really amazing strategies. And I've just um, broken these into microbial attack versus attack of a macro herbivore. But um, in terms of, say, a bacterium or a fungus um, that, say, might invade the tissue through the sto stomata, which is an opening, a natural opening that plants have to keep open, but it does make them vulnerable. Um, their cuticle can ward off a lot of um, microbes, but the Stomates are one place where they can be attacked. A particular microbe entering through the stomates um, can be recognized by plants. And there are proteins that are produced by plant pathogens, um, disease-causing agents, that uh, where we have essentially an arms race going on between the attacker and the plant in terms of the plant's ability to recognize that attacker so much like we do in terms of disease response. And plants, in, if they recognize the attacker, they often have a very local and specific response to that particular agent. And they can produce a natural pesticide that will be um, deadly to that particular agent. And at the same time, they can undergo programmed cell death in the region of that attack. So they can wall off that part of their, their body that's being attacked by 
a microbe, and um, at the same time that they're attacking it with a natural pesticide. So this is what we call a hypersensitive response on the part of the plant. Okay, so that's one way in which they can protect themselves from microbes. And when they're undergoing an attack like that, this is also going to result in general stimulation of plant defense genes in general, not just the specific ones, but uh, other plant defense genes. And this can result in protection against the diversity of pathogens that can last for a number of days. This is what we call systemic acquired resistance by the plant. So we have both of these things going on in the case of a microbial attack. Okay, as far as herbivores go, so big chomping uh, animals, um, for example, um, arthropods like insects or mites, um, or larger uh, vertebrate herbivores, these can be warded off by physical defenses, of course, like the cuticle, spines, things like that, hairs on the leaf that are difficult to, for an insect to penetrate, or glandular exudates they produce. Um, but th those glandular exudates and uh, chemistry that's inside the, the leaf of the plant can also be important in warding off um, herbivores by producing these substances, which are called secondary metabolites, which are just basically any chemical that's produced by a plant that's not involved, that's not necessary for survival and reproduction of the plant per se. These, there's a vast diversity of chemicals that plants produce that are not involved in primary metabolism. And when I was an undergraduate, the typical plant ecologist was unwilling to accept that these chemicals weren't just waste products. You know, plants can't easily excrete their waste, so these are just accumulated waste products. But it turns out that, that these chemicals often have a really, uh, really are important in, in warding off attack by particular herbivores. They're either um, toxic, directly toxic to the herbivore, or they're distasteful, um, and in general, they're harmful to their enemies. Also, in some cases, the actual attack, the saliva, for example, of the attacker is recognized by the plant, and the plant can produce volatile airborne chemicals that will signal that this attacker is present. And here we can see, for example, some mites that are attacking some tomatoes, volatile chemicals produced. For example, here is a predatory mite picks up on this volatile chemical that's carried in the air and that initiates a response on the part of the mite to go to the tomato plant because that's, that's like a ringing the food bell um, means that there are, there's a tasty um, item on those tomato plants and the predatory mites then come to the rescue. So this is essentially like a chemical call for help by the plant. Of course, the predatory mite doesn't really have altruistic um, intentions to go to rescue the plant, but it rescues the plant anyways by coming and eating its um, attacker. So plants have all kinds of physical defenses, chemical defenses like alkaloids, terpenes, and other secondary chemicals that we're familiar with that are, can be highly toxic to us um, or, or can be useful in various ways. And they even can um, basically bring on an attacker, or they can warn neighboring plants about the presence of an attacker um, that can also help uh, with regard to, um, with, uh, for example, signaling close relatives of the presence of an attacker. So plants do a lot of amazing things, and I hope that um, this part of the course has been interesting to you. And if you do have more interest in learning more about plant and fungal diversity, um, or ecology and evolution. There's a lot of courses offered here at Cal, because we have the Natural History Museums. There are a lot of faculty here that study organisms of great diversity. And these are just a few of the courses that, um, on behalf of myself and the other instructors, I want to strongly con 
uh, encourage you to consider taking after you pass this course, which will, is the major prerequisite for, for most of these courses. So it's been a pleasure having the course, and um, good luck with studying. Hope to see you Wednesday. Thanks.